Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is from Philippians 3, 15 to 21. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This ends the reading of the word. Thank you, Barry, for that reading. I would like to also add to Derek's welcome, my own welcome, to each one of you. And uh, Happy New Year as well from me to all of you. We, it, it felt funny, as Derek said, you know, we kind of said Happy New Year last Sunday to everybody because we were right on the verge of it. But this is also the first time we've seen each other in the new year, many of us. So. I hope that your new year has gone well so far. If you're visiting here and are new, um, please say a word on your way out to introduce yourself. Um, it's been good to see different folks coming in here over these recent months. And uh, if you're getting used to our congregation, getting acquainted, but maybe don't know many people yet, um, just know that this church family, I think, is a welcoming and friendly group, and uh, we'd love to be able to get to know you better and to make your transition into this uh, body uh, an easy and enjoyable one as you get to know us. I want to mention as well, um, Bonnie already prayed um, for those that are unwell among us with different things and I did want to just share with you that we are also praying for Gordon Irving right now. He's um, going into the hospital today to have a heart surgery tomorrow, open heart surgery, and so he said it was okay to share that with our church family so you can be praying for him. We will be some weeks before we're seeing him back in the choir and uh, participating in those ways, but he would appreciate us to continue to keep him in prayer, especially tomorrow and in the days of recovery for him. So we're going to spend some time now getting back into this series in uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, which we had started back in the, in the fall and then took a break as we entered into the this season leading up to Christmas, we did one of these Philippian series during Advent, but then we had some special days. We had guests, and we had cantata, and we had musical times, and, and just things going on that have led us to step away from this series. But I do want us to return to it and spend the next few weeks finishing up our reading of uh, Philippians. So we're in this passage that, that Barry just read for us, these seven verses from 15 to 21 at the end of chapter 3, and I'm just going to ask God to be with us as we look into the word together this morning. Lord, now as we have heard these words, words encouraging us to follow the example of those who are following in the way of Jesus Christ as we have heard about the challenges that are around us in being led into alternative ways of looking at the world that are different from your way we recognize that it is hard for us to keep our eyes focused on you and so we pray that during these moments and uh, time that we spend together looking into your word that you would help us to have clear eyes for what you have done and who you are and what you say to us and the life you're calling us to 
even here at the beginning of a new year, when we often think about our life and which way it is pointed, we pray that you would help us as a church family to be pointed in the direction of Jesus, because it's in him we believe that we have seen the truly human life. So we thank you for him, for your meeting us in him, and for your presence with us by your spirit still. And we pray that as we spend time in your word now, that you would be alongside us, teaching us whatever it is that each one of us may need to hear, encouraging us to whatever we need to be encouraged toward, comforting us for whatever we may need comfort for. We ask all of these things and your blessing upon each one here in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this passage has a word in it in verse 17 that I've used in the title of the message, and that is the word model. And I mean here not the type that goes down a runway with new clothes, but the kind that is a role model that gives us a, a way to look at what life ought to be and how we might shape our lives in a certain direction. Paul is concerned here to talk to us about the benefit that comes from having people to model our lives upon. Now, I believe we all do this in everyday life already. We're, we're following role models, whether we do it consciously or not, and we learn to do it at an early age. Now, many of you, I'm guessing, have seen the movie Jaws at some point, the original, not one of the sequels, that movie that has made many of us afraid to go into the ocean water ever. But there's a scene in that movie where Chief Brody is sitting at his table and he's realized that he's made some wrong decisions. He's trying to puzzle out what he's doing. And when we see this quiet scene begin, we see him sitting at the table with his, his, hand, his head resting on his closed fist. And the camera pulls back and we see his little boy sitting at the table as well and his hand is on his closed, his head is on his closed fist as well. And Chief Brody sits there and we know all the things that are going through his mind as he does what grown-ups do when they are stressed out. He puts his head in his hands. He rubs his, his forehead. He covers his face. All of these things and we start to notice before he does that his little boy is copying every move that he's making. So as he rubs his forehead, we see the little six-year-old boy rub his forehead. When he, in exhaustion, reaches out for his glass of water, the little boy reaches out for his glass of water. And then, of course, he starts to pick up on the fact that he's being copied, as we all have at different times in our lives. And then he starts to make a face, and the boy makes the face back at him. And it's a very sweet scene, but it points to something that we all know which is that children are watching. Children are watching what's going on, and they are copying. But we don't stop when we are children. Even if, yes, we go to school when we're five, six, seven years old, and we come home, and we find that we start saying the things that we have heard our teachers say in the classroom because they're perfect and they're better than our parents and they're the, the best adult that could ever be. And we try to be their way. And then, of course, you grow up and you grow past that. But then different people become the models of your life, right? When you're a teenager, your role models might be your, your favorite sports player or something like that. But as we continue through life, we find that the people that we are around have an influence on us. So I can point to a couple of friends in my life who, without realizing I was doing it, I started picking up habits of the way they speak so that I have still, and I'm not going to say it now, certain habits in my speech that I picked up from my friend Tyler and that if I was to say it to you, you'd all be picking on me every time I do it because I'm, I'm trying to break the habit sometimes. It's not a bad thing, but I realize I got it from him. I never spoke that way before. And I could say this about other people as well. Different phrases that we pick up because when we're around it, if we have ears and if we have eyes, we are picking up the ways of the people that are around us regularly. 
And most of the time, that's not necessarily uh, an either positive or negative thing, but it shows us how much we can be influenced by those who we have our eyes and ears open to. And this passage in Philippians is looking at this reality that we're all picking up habits from the people that surround us. And we are challenged in this passage to adopt good models that will lead us toward the true life that is found in Jesus Christ, as opposed to the models that we will pick up on if we don't deliberately find models in the way of Jesus. We will pick up on other models, and we all are doing this all the time. And so Paul wants to say, watch out which way you look for your examples in your life. Now, the context, in a sense, in this letter is really, Philippians is all about following an example of somebody else, and it centers on Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at, a couple of weeks before Christmas, I should say, we looked at Philippians chapter 2, in which Paul tells the story of Jesus himself, and he in a sense, he is saying the center of the universe and its truth and what real human life is all about is found in Jesus Christ. And he tells the story of Jesus who, while he was in eternity with his father, he had that glory that was to be there. And then he came at a certain point in time, which we just celebrated a couple of weeks ago. He came and lived among us. And that was an act of humility, of setting aside the glory that came with his position in heaven. And then beyond just letting go of that uh, glory and becoming humble, he was obedient all through his life to the plan that he and his father had made, which led to the point of his death on a cross. And Jesus is seen as going into the, the life that we live and even into the depths of the suffering that we feel and they're healing us of what was wrong and there after that it says God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus one day every knee will bow every tongue confess that he is the Lord that he is equal with his father with whom he always was in relationship and always was our maker and our God. And Paul has told that story of Jesus and says that's where real life is to be found. And while you're going through life, he's saying, while you're feeling the difficulties that come inevitably in life, you are to see your life in relationship with Jesus and realize that God is the one who brings life out of death. God is the one who brings resurrection out of crucifixion. And we find that the pattern of our difficulty and our joy is found in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, this is the view you need to take, is this long view of life. Don't only look at the moment that you're living in right now. If you do, you're gonna go in all kinds of wrong directions. The true human life that leads to real and lasting glory is the life of Jesus. And Paul has been telling the church that that's the road that you are on. Remember, Philippians 1.6 says that God is going to bring your life to completion in Jesus Christ. Let me read the verse in full that many of you have memorized. He says, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is what we're being encouraged to see our life as being all about. But it's easy for us to live for something else. And so here in this chapter, and here's where if you've got your Bible, it will be helpful for you to look at the verses that we're paying attention to now. In verses 18 and 19, Paul talks about people who are living without that long view of life, who are only living for this moment. And he uses harsh words about the way that they are living. 
He says, I've often told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross there seen as the, the key moment of the world's history and the moment that will make sense of all of our lives as we see ourselves in Jesus. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. What's he getting at here when he says that there are people, we know them, perhaps we are them, whose God is their stomach, especially after Christmas time. You've all known what it is to serve your stomach for a few days. But he doesn't just mean our literal stomachs and our, our engagement with food, our relationship with food, whether it's healthy or not healthy. But with all the things that make us feel good in the moment, but that ultimately are an illusion. They're not going to give you fulfillment. And there's loads of things, and I don't need to name them right now, that feel like they're going to be satisfying, that do give us a moment's pleasure, but that sometimes have disastrous consequences, and sometimes they're just meaningless. But this is what we are, I believe, encouraged all the time to live our lives for. The things that are pulling on our attention all the time are almost always about this moment, not about the long view of what your life's meaning is. And we are led into being people who live shallow lives of making today feel good for me instead of deep lives that are about learning where my place is in relation to God and how I might serve God's children and God's creation and God's world in the best way possible. And so Paul says, you've got these examples around you. They're pulling on you. Like the child looking at the ways of his father. If we're not careful, we're just following the ways that are leading us into pleasure and satisfaction in the moment. And he says that's not where you'll find satisfaction and fulfillment. And so he leads us into a place of thinking about things differently. He says their mind is set on earthly things and what he wants for us to do is have a shift in our way of thinking, to have a mind shift, to have a, a mind transformation, to stop looking just for this moment and start looking for something more. He says your life is found in Jesus Christ. Somewhere else it says your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's where your true self is found is in the very heart of Jesus. He loves you more than those ones who want to sell you into ways of living that are just good for this moment. And here he uses the phrase, our citizenship is in heaven. Now let me just briefly explain the meaning of that phrase. We might look at it as telling us that Everything that's happening here on earth, if we think earth versus heaven, everything on earth is meaningless. Your home that you want to wish for and to go to is heaven, and the sooner the better. And there may be aspects of that that are true and that can even be found in Paul's letter here, where he says to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Like, I love this life I'm living and the service I'm doing, but it would be better to be with Jesus. Now, that's hard for us to get our heads around because all we know is this life. So there's a piece of truth in that way of reading this. But what Paul is really getting at is this. Your true identity is found in heaven in terms of Jesus and your relationship with him. And what it means for him to say our citizenship is in heaven is that is your homeland. And while you live here on earth, don't ever forget that that's where you're from. It's not about that's where you're going, although that's true as well. But that's where you're from. So that just as we have people here among us whose citizenship is from another country, but they live here. They live here among us. And ambassadors, of course, are the... the easiest and, and most clear example of this. People who, as representatives of one place, go and live in another. 
so that they can have conversations with the people there on behalf of their homeland. That's the task we've been given, is to be people who know ourselves to be heavenly citizens, and that our place now is to, to be here in this world as people who have seen the truth, who have seen the glory of Jesus, and who now get to share little bits of where we're from with the people that we live with here in this world, and perhaps invite them into knowing the realities that we have come to know in Jesus. And so he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and now we're waiting for a savior from there, our Lord Jesus Christ, who he's going to come, and he's going to make all the things, all the promises, resurrection after crucifixion, life out of death, he's going to make them all true and fulfilled one day when he comes back. And Paul is always looking in this letter to that day when Jesus comes back, and it's all brought to be clearly seen as true. So this is what we're told, is that we have people around us, all of us have them, and many of them, let's be honest, I, I name this a lot, but a lot of them are on our phones, our, our models that are pulling us into a different way of living. But then we have this true story of Jesus, and Paul says what we need is to shift our minds away from the moment into the big picture because it's the truth and we're all going to reckon with it one day. We're all going to face Jesus. We're all going to see him and we want to be rejoicing at his coming because he's bringing life with him and even now he brings life to us. And so he says, you need examples that will lead you in the way of Jesus. And what does he say? He says, follow my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Now, he's already in this letter been giving examples left and right. He has talked about Timothy, the young man who is living for Jesus and faithful in his service. He's talked about Epaphroditus, the ailing and frail man who's been through sickness and, and trial. And yet he's done it faithfully for Jesus. And of course, he's looked at Jesus himself, and he's now pointing to himself, Paul, the apostle, and saying, follow my example. Now, oh, to be able to say, follow my example as I follow Christ. It's what we all ought to be able to say. But I'm afraid that when we look at ourselves, we realize we'd be afraid to tell people, follow my example, because I'm following the example of Jesus. But that's what Paul says here, and it's what we're encouraged to do. And so what I want to do is spend the rest of the time talking about how we might find some examples, where we might find them, and encourage all of you to find these examples that will lead you and help you and lead me and help me in the way of Jesus. Because from the earliest time, the followers of Jesus were, they realized how important it was to set out example, examples of lives that are lived for Jesus. So that within the New Testament, we see these examples like the ones that I've mentioned. But then very soon after that, in the end of the first century and into the second century AD, we find that stories start to be told of people who died well. And that's what it starts at. It starts as, because as we know from history, by the end of the first century, there were incidents of persecution coming that sometimes led followers of Jesus to be put to death by the Roman Empire. And so these stories started to be told. Stories of martyrs like Polycarp, who died in the middle of the second century at 86 years old, or maybe even older because he talks about, I've served Jesus for 86 years as he's, as he's giving his last words before he is put to death, burned by the Roman authorities. The Christians told the story of Polycarp as he made his way and how he said, for 86 years, Jesus has been faithful to me. How could I now deny my Lord? But then another 50, 75 years later, we hear stories of 
not an old man, but two young women. Perpetua and Felicity were their names, both of them in their very early 20s. One of them a noblewoman, the other one a slave. One of them holding an infant child, the other one pregnant. And both of them, along with three other people, had been getting ready for baptism. They were new converts, and they were in the process of learning about the faith and ready to be baptized, to declare themselves publicly as Christians. And then they were all arrested and put in prison and ultimately put to death. What a way to bear public witness to their faith in Jesus. And they've been remembered ever since. But then beyond those times, we start seeing not the exa- just the stories of people who died well, but the stories of people who lived well. So that we hear in the fourth century, the story of uh, Anthony of Egypt. And his story is told by a leader in the church named Athanasius who wrote this biography of him. And Anthony was a rich man. And he heard the gospel of Jesus. And he heard particularly the call of Jesus That rich people might have to take into consideration selling everything they have and give to the poor. And he took those words as literally God's word to him. And he sold off his possessions. He gave everything he had to the poor. And then he dedicated his life to a life of simplicity and prayer. Beginning a movement of people who would go out to the, the desert in Egypt and live their lives as prayerful lives. Knowing God, fighting with the devil, and seeking God's ways, and turned out to be amazing examples to other people, both in the cities and others who took on this life. But there are also people whose lives got told who really lived the lives like we do. So we read about a woman named Monica. Monica lived in the fourth century as well. And I'm not going to go through every century, I promise you. This last one is an example. But there are loads of them we could look at. And Monica was a woman who was in an unhappy marriage. Now, her husband respected her, we are told, but he had a bad temper and he had affairs. And she stuck through this marriage. She suffered what what suffering comes when you have a spouse who's doing all of that. And in addition to the pain that she had in her marriage, she also had the pain of watching her very talented son go off at the end of his teenage years and just begin to live as a wild partier, living, as Paul says, for his stomach, living in the moment for his pleasures and the pleasure of life. And Monica was a Christian, and she prayed for her son. She had taught him about Jesus. That's hard when you're the only parent doing it, as many people have known. And she watched him go off into adulthood and seemingly squander all of his gifts by sending them all in the direction that she knew was not true. The direction that's living for now instead of living for eternity, living for yourself rather than living for Jesus, God, and others. And she prayed for that son, and she prayed for that son, and many of you have prayed for a child who has gone astray. And she waited a couple of decades. Her son was in his mid-30s when finally he had what turned out to be one of the most famous conversions of all time. Because this woman's son was a man who is known to us as St. Augustine, one of the, the great teachers of all of history in the church. His writings take shelves and shelves up of of the things that he meditated on and wrote about Jesus from the middle of his 30s onward because when he gave his life to Jesus, a result of his mother's prayers and an answer to his mother's prayers, he gave himself fully to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear these stories, they make me think about my death when it comes in a different light and they make me think about my life in a different light when I'm living it right now. And we are called, Paul says, to find examples, to find patterns that will inspire us to living the true life, the life that is found in Jesus Christ. We need to look for these patterns of discipleship, of following Jesus, as we respond to what we've heard here. And we might find them when we look around us 
in individuals that we have known. And I suspect that all of us who have had a moment when we really gave our heart, either for the first time or more fully, to Jesus, it came often from seeing somebody, or maybe a group of somebodies, who seemed to live a different way, whose lives spoke to you. And that's what Paul's talking about here. But the thing that happens for many of us is even if we can think back to those lives that inspired us, the novelty eventually wore off, and we stopped paying attention to those kinds of lives, and we started getting drawn into the rest of the lives around us. And so I want to encourage us to find lives of people we know, people who can be a model to us in one aspect or, aspect or another of our following Jesus, but also to realize that we may have to look further than just the circles that we live in and the people that we travel with. And I suspect that now, at this moment, when it's harder and harder to find people who are really living these selfless lives of devotion to God, submission to Him, and desiring to serve Him and others in this world, that we're going to have to look further than just the circles we already know. And Paul would encourage us to do that, to look across the globe, perhaps, or to look at people that come from different cultures than ours in the West who have followed Jesus in a different context, and maybe to look down the hallway of time, as I've just given you a little example of in the stories that I have told. And as we do that, as we look and find these examples, these lives that can be patterns for us, we will find a, a witness to a different kind of life than the life that is lived all around us. And I want to encourage you to realize that you're seeing there a truer life, a more meaningful life, a deeper life, and a life that is rewarded in the end with the fullness of all of God's gifts when we come to see the truth of the Jesus we have believed in and served. I want to encourage us to listen to the stories of people whose lives have been changed by Jesus. And usually in any congregation like this, what that means is that we especially need to listen to the lives of the newest converts among us. That may seem counterintuitive to saying, like, we want to follow those who are mature examples, because we do, but I think we also need to listen when people have just discovered what a difference Jesus makes in their life, because that can remind us of the difference that he can make for us if we don't take him for granted so much. We also do want to look out for people who do exhibit great holiness in their life, whose lives seem to be lived, in a sense, for something much deeper, something much more meaningful. And really what we're doing as we do this is following not just the example of the person in front of us, but we're getting a window onto Jesus, because he is the true example. At the heart of the letter to the Philippians, and he's the one that we actually first see talking about living a life in the example of another. As he says in one place in John's gospel, I always do what my father is doing. The picture we have of Jesus is the picture of a son looking always into the face of his father and living what he sees there. It's what he did when he was here among us. It's what he is doing right now, staring into the face of his father all of us on his mind too, but looking back and forth, the one to the other, father to son, and seeing there a perfect and full life. One day we look forward to seeing that face ourselves. We don't see it now except through these mirrors on it that we might find in the examples around us, but one day we will see him face to face. And the examples that we have followed will lead us to be able to smile in the face of the Lord when we see him. And we can say with the words at the end of Psalm 17, As for me, I will be vindicated, and I will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. May that be true for all of us when we reach the end of our days. Let's pray. Lord, lead us. As we seek to live for Jesus, help us to find examples along the way that will show us the beauty 
and the truth and the goodness of this life that has been revealed to us in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.